Right before we jump into this video, if you'd like me to send you a free guide to capturing motion in low light situations, just look for this orange box over on the website, put your name, email address in it, hit send it, and I will send you that guide for free. Jared Polin, Fronos Photo. Dot com and this is a real world review of the Canon RF 800mm f11 as well as the RF 600mm f11 and for good measures the 1.4x converter and the 2x converter get thrown on while I was at the zoo. So like I just said I took these lenses out to the zoo and the two cameras that I used were the R6 as well as the R5, as that's what these lenses are designed to go on. So at the zoo, I photographed some eagles, some gorillas, the flamingos, a baby flamingo as well, as well as a cheetah. Look, did you kill a cheetah? Now, before I get into sample images, I want to take a look at the 800 and the 600 and tell you more about the outside of the lenses and give you some specs about them, starting with the 800 f 11. That's right, it's so heavy. No, it's not actually super heavy. It is super compact. But if you're going to put it onto your camera, guess what you need to do? You need to turn this to unlock. Then you need to do this to embiggen it. And then you still need to lock it back into place. If you put this, or when you put this onto your R5 or R6, and it's in the shut mode like this, it's like, you turn the camera on, it's like, uh, you need to unlock and open it. So then you're like, okay, unlock and open it. And then it still doesn't work because it's like, you need to lock it. Okay, so then you have to actually lock it in place. But in all honesty, this is pretty compact for an 800 millimeter. Now, I should stop for a moment and tell you that when Canon announced these things, I was like, this can't be real. 800 f11? What are you gonna do with an 800 f11? But when they tell you the pricing of the lenses, you're like, I mean, I kind of get it. They're meant to be inexpensive lenses that somebody who may not be a full-time professional just wants something for spotting a bird. Oh, look, it's a spotted dick lily or whatever the hell they're called. I don't know what birds are called because I'm not a birder, but it could be good for something like that. Now, moving around this lens, let's talk about the outside. You have a limiter for your focus. You have your AF to manual switch, though I'm not sure anybody could actually manually focus this at a distance unless the subject really wasn't moving. And you have the all important on and off switch for the stabilization. That is super important when you are shooting photos because you're out at 800 millimeters, you need stabilization. You're gonna be better off having image stabilization in the body as well in combination because with the combination of the R5 or the R6, you should be getting roughly eight stops of image stabilization. And I'm gonna show you why that comes in handy when we get into the sample images. Around the front of the lens, this is a 95 millimeter cap. If you lose it, you're gonna have to buy another one and it's gonna be more expensive than other caps because it's 95 millimeters. Now there is a filter thread on the outside here and there is a place to put a lens hood. The lens hood does not come in the box. It's an added accessory. I didn't even think about it when I went out and shot the other day that I didn't have a lens hood on because I would have looked even more ridiculous with the lens being super extended with a lens hood out on the end of it. But don't worry, even if you get a lens hood and everything is fully extended, the close focusing distance of this lens is 20 feet. Now let's talk about the weight. This one weighs in at 2.77 pounds or 1260 grams and will set you back only $899. Now I say only for the reason that if you wanted to get something like an 805.6 from Canon, you can spend like 12, $13,000 to get something like that and that's gonna weigh like 12 pounds. It's gonna be really expensive. Whereas this isn't, but it's an F11 which makes me wonder, is everything gonna be in focus when you take pictures? We'll see when we get to the other photos, but let's look at the 600 millimeter right here. This is the 600 millimeter. It is extremely tiny. This is gonna fit in your shoulder bag standing up without a problem. As long as you have a shoulder bag that isn't one of those miniature ones that Canon sells you, because those are super small and super dinky. I do recommend my camera bag, the Think Tank Retrospective 30 Fronos Photo I Shoot Raw Stealth Edition. There's a couple still left in the store as we speak. Same thing applies here, unlock, in big in lock again and you're good to go. Same exact functions on the outside 
of the lens. The one thing I didn't mention that the uh, about the 800 that the 600 also has is this control ring right here on the outside of the lens. If you want to set it to ISO, if you want to set it to exposure compensation, you can go ahead and set that. I personally never set it. I actually turned it off inside of my R5 as well as R6. In terms of the filter thread on this bad boy, we are at what, 82 millimeters. It's an 82 millimeter filter thread. The same thing applies that it did not come with the lens hood. I do always recommend using lens hoods when you're outside, but to be honest with you, if it came with a lens hood, it wouldn't have fit in the camera bag that I used because my bag was packed to the gills with everything that I needed to go photograph at the zoo. In terms of weight, the 600 weighs in at 2.05 pounds or 930 grams and will set you back $699. And the close focusing distance on this one is only 15 feet. So now let's jump into some sample images from the zoo, but I do want to remind you that you can download sample raw files. The link is up on the screen as well as in the description below. You're going to get raw files shot with both of these lenses as well as both of these cameras. There's not many people out there who have these lenses or have the ability to convert the CR3s to DNGs, but I have that ability and I'm sharing it with you. Let's start looking at the first image, which is this bald eagle. This one is shot with the 800 millimeter at 1 400th of a second at F11 ISO 1000. I shot this around noon. If you're outside, even around noon, you're gonna need a lot of light because you're at F11. That means you may need to slow your shutter speed down a little bit or raise your ISO, but if you slow your shutter speed down too far, you may run into some handshake or your subject may start to go uh, and blur if they're moving and your shutter speed's too slow. There's a lot of things that you need to take into consideration when using these lenses. If you just throw it on your camera in full auto, the ISO is gonna be sky high and you may not know what you're doing and why your images are looking like crap, but it is a potential possibility that your images look like crap because your settings will be so far off. But they didn't look like crap for me because this eagle looks super amazing just sitting there on its perch, so sharp, so clean, super nice. I do wanna zoom in on the background here. This is a fence in the background. This is not an issue with the lens. There's actually a big metal fence that you have to shoot through. And when you see that in the background, it blows out. It gives you some bokeh, which is interesting because I was like, well, at F11, is this going to go out of focus? And you can see it right here that if I didn't tell you this was at F11, you wouldn't know that this wasn't a 2.8, an F4, a 5.6. I mean, unless you really knew what you were looking at, because a 2.8 is going to blow out the background even more, but this eagle is separated without a problem from the background, and I think it looks nice and colorful and nice and good, and this one was done with the R6. You're gonna see that I switch around between the 600 and the 800, uh, as well as the R5 and the R6, and I thought this should all go in one review because these lenses are very similar to each other. It's just trying to help you determine, do you need a six, do you need an eight, do you not need them at all? Let me cut in here real quick and let you know that the images that you're seeing on the screen right now were taken during this review and edited with FroPack 2. If you're looking to speed up your raw workflow or give yourself a great starting point, we created 15 all new custom Lightroom presets that you can check out right now at fronosphoto.com slash FroPack 2. While you're over there, you can play with the sliders to see the befores and the afters. And if you decide to pick them up right now, they are currently on sale or you can save even more by bundling FroPack 1 and FroPack 2 together and getting the FroPack bundle. Now let's get back into the review. Moving on to the next image, there is a photo of a gorilla. Now when I first got there, the first thing that I did was see if the gorillas were outside playing and they actually weren't. And then I started to walk away and somebody was like, they just came out. Kind of like you. It's not funny, Steven, not funny at all. Anyway, so I went back and I set up to take the photos. Now you'll notice that I'm using a GoPro on the top of my camera. Generally speaking with the Nikon and the Sonys, we're able to record the EVF to show you exactly what I'm seeing through the camera. In this case, we can't do that with a recorder on top and still allow me to see through the camera at what I'm shooting. So that's why we use the GoPro. But you can see how far away this gorilla is from me. This time around, I'm using the the R5 with the 600 millimeter F11. We're at 1 640th of a second, 1600 ISO. So I bumped that up much higher in order to give me the 1 640th of a second because the gorillas were not just sitting around, they were moving around searching for food out in the yard. But zooming in, 
really nice. The colors, the tones, the clarity was not expected. But if you look at the wall behind the Gorilla, you know, we're at F11. If we were at 2.8, that background's gonna blow out even more. So the closer the subject is to the background, the more prevalent the background is going to be, the less you're going to isolate the subject. But when we go to the next image of the gorilla up in the, the, the little tree fort that they just built, you can see we're again at F11. This time I have an 800 millimeter lens and because the trees in the background are further away, they're not as distracting as the wall in the image before. These are the things you need to think about at F11. There's so much more depth of field in there than at 5.6 or at 2.8 or at f4 so i think the background looks fine i have no problem looking at this and going okay it looks fine now some other people will pixel peep and be like the bokeh is terrible and i'll be like it's an 899 dollars 800 millimeter f11 lens what did you expect they're not trying to sell it as the greatest lens since sliced bread, but it's a lens that gives you 800 millimeters or 600 millimeters in such a small package nothing else can compete with it Continuing on, we have a portrait of the, I believe this was the silverback, the, the patriarch of the family. This was done with the 800 millimeter lens as well as the R5. I spent more time using the 800 millimeter lens because a lot of the things that happen at the zoo happen further away from you. Most times that I'm at the zoo, I've got the longest lens of like a 600 and I can do some pretty good damage with that. But having this 800 was made it so much fun to be out there because I was able to reach out and grab images that I couldn't reach otherwise. On the flip side, being that it's not a zoom lens, if an animal or a subject is too close to you, the lens is, is useless because you don't have the ability to zoom in or zoom out, whichever way you don't have the ability to make it wider, you have to step back if you can and try to get the subject in the frame. Let's zoom in on the eyes of this one and I'm really happy with how they look. I mean, at F11, everything should kind of be in focus within a certain range. The autofocus worked fine here. There was no problem. It didn't do a lot of hunting. It was pretty accurate and pretty fast while even tracking the subjects as they were walking. Uh, I will turn on IAF later on for the images. In this case, I didn't have the IAF on. I just had the lock on tracking and it would find the subject and it would just bounce around and it and it worked. It did a good job, but I will say that the IAF works much better for animal tracking and you'll see that in a couple of images coming up. But I was really happy with this raw file and I think you guys will be too as well when you go ahead and give it a download. Moving on to the next image, we have another photo of an eagle. Now the reason I'm bringing this up is because I used an Atomos recorder to show you exactly what you would see if you put your eye up to the viewfinder. Now because this camera doesn't let me record my viewfinder and still let me look through the viewfinder, I had to hold the camera out like this when I was shooting, so it's a little more unstable, but it also is a really good test to show how good the IBIS is inside the body as well as in combination with the image stabilization built into the lens. So the reason I'm showing you my electronic viewfinder for this is because I switched into Animal IAF. Now that's where the autofocus of the camera is going to be searching for the eye and track it no matter where it moves. So if the eagle turns its head and it goes from the left eye to the right eye or the right eye to the left eye, the IAF should continually track the eye. And even if the eagle turns its head and you have the back of the head, it doesn't move focus to the background. It still finds focus somewhere and then when that eye reappears, it does find that eye once again. Now I know that this subject isn't really moving very far or moving very fast. I mean, in one of the scenes, the eagle decides it wants to throw up and you can watch the box move as it tracks the subject. Do I think it's perfect and the fastest thing ever? It's not perfect, it's not the fastest thing ever, but it does a very good and consistent job. Look at the image. Zooming in on the eye here at 1 400th of a second with the EOS R6, look how nice and sharp and colorful that is. So that's showing you that with the IAF, it did a very good job in this situation. Let me jump in here and let you know that this video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you're looking to build your very own portfolio, use what I use for my website, jaredpolen.com, and head on over to squarespace.com slash photo to get your 14-day free trial. If you decide that it's for you, use the code Froknows photo at checkout 
checkout to get 10% off your first order. Next up, we've got one at 600 millimeters uh, with the Flamingos. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is this one is at 600 millimeters, and the next picture of the Flamingo is at 800 millimeters with the 800 millimeter lens. So if you can take a step forward or a step back and you have the ability to do that, you could get some similar results between the 600 and the 800. I found myself loving the 800 more because it filled the frame more without having to crop. A lot of people talk about cropping and how, well, I can just crop it later. Sure, you could, but the more you cut down on the megapixels, the more you cut down on that data that you're capturing, the more issues will show up in your images, especially with an f11 lens when, when you get your exposure wrong. If you get it wrong and you try to correct it and then you try to crop, you're gonna have more issues with your final images. So while I was photographing the flamingos, something caught my eye. There was something with white feathers and I'm like, what is like a pigeon or a seagull doing in there with the flamingos? But then when I checked the photo, I was like, oh my God, it's a baby flamingo. Look at him. He doesn't have his color yet. And look at his legs. They're so short. I wonder how quick they grow and I wonder how old flamingos go. Hey Dan, pop up how old flamingos can be from Wikipedia. Anyway, zooming in on this little birdie, Hi, little birdie. He looks really good right there. I can tell you I'm pretty surprised with the results. I, I really am. I wasn't expecting to see the type of images that I was able to capture with both the R6 and the R5 with both the 800 as well as the 600. It's much better than I expected. And look at this. Reaching out and grabbing the cheetah, yawning. The cheetah was yawning. The IAF was on the eye until it closed and then it went to the face detect, which it then overrides to. and. They're in focus, but this is at 4,000 ISO and my shutter speed is only at 1 200th of a second at F11. That's important because if this cheetah was running, there is no way in hell that I would have been able to get a sharp image of the cheetah. The only reason I could shoot at 1 200th of a second because the cheetah was in the shade was because I was at 4,000 ISO on the R5. So if you are trying to photograph during dawn, or you're trying to photograph at night, which won't happen with this lens, or you're indoors, which won't happen with this lens, or at sundown, you're going to have to be very careful and cognizant of where your settings are. This is why it's very important to understand the exposure triangle. If you're just an amateur who throw, which there's nothing wrong with being an amateur or a hobbyist, but if you throw these lenses on any of these cameras in full auto, the camera is going to do all of the work for you. That means even if the exposure is correct, but the ISO is at like 20,000, your images may come back looking grainy and noisy and with not a lot of good color in that. And the reason being is the ISO was so high. So you can't get angry at the lens and you can't get angry at the camera. You have to get angry at yourself if you get really bad results with the exposure because you need to understand how to manage and handle your exposure triangle, especially in situations where you're using these lenses. Now, like I said early on, I did take the teleconverters out with me, the 1.4 and the 2X. Now, I don't believe that they're designed specifically for the 600 and the 800, and the reason being is they're painted white. Now, usually that's reserved for the L lenses and the higher, more expensive lenses, which leads me to believe that you'll see a 300-2.8, a 400-2.8, a 500-F4, maybe, maybe not, but a 600-F4 and an 800-5.6 at some point that will pair very nicely with the 2X and the 1X converter. Now, with that being said, the 2X and the 1.4X converters work on both of these lenses, but keep in mind, if you have an 800 millimeter F11 and you put a 2X converter on that, it becomes a 1600 millimeter F22, which means you're gonna lose even more light and that rant I just went on is going to be even more true if you try to shoot at F22. I'm gonna show you examples right now. This is 1600 millimeters because I have a 2X converter on the 800 millimeter lens. This is at F22 and the ISO is at 4000 on the R5 at 1 320th of a second. Now my exposure was off by at least a stop. If I was to get my exposure right here, the ISO would have been at 8000 or it would have been at 1 1 60th of a second, which then gives me the possibility of getting some motion blur if the bird moves. This is, uh, the, the fact that this is in focus 
is, is insane because trying to handhold this when you're shooting at 1600 millimeters, the combination of the IBIS in the body and the IS in the lens worked really well and I got lucky in this situation. Whereas for a photo like this one, when we zoom in on it, I'm at 1 1 60th of a second at F16, ISO 1000. This one was with a 600 millimeter F11 with the 1.4X teleconverter on there, thus making it 840 millimeters. But I've got some blur there. I've got some motion blur that's happening because the bird probably moved when I was taking a picture, but I was at 1 1 60th of a second. This is what I'm talking about. If your shutter speed is too slow and a subject is moving ever so slightly, even at all, you're running the risk of getting blur and the photo not being usable, which is exactly what happened here. So you have to bump the ISO and you have to get a faster shutter speed when you're out here capturing the birds. But look at this 1600 millimeters. Look at the talons. Do the chickens have large talons? The chickens have sharp talons, Napoleon. What? I've honestly never shot at 1600 millimeters. 1 3 20th of a second, F22. And even at F22, let's go back to that bird picture real fast. The background's out of focus because it's being compressed so much at 1600 millimeters, even at F22, it's out of focus. That's pretty crazy that that happens there. And now to the final image, again, 1600 millimeters. To be able to get the framing and to get the composition right when hand holding a lens like this, especially with the 2X converter with an 800 millimeter on there, that is, that is insanity. Let me jump in here and remind you that the super huger mega camera giveaway is going on right now, where I'm giving one of you the chance to win cameras and lenses valued up to $4,999. You can get entered for free at bit.ly slash megafro2020. Also, if you pick up Fro Pack 1, Fro Pack 2, or the Fro Pack bundle, or any of my guides, or you already own them, you will get extra entries. But as always, there is no purchase necessary to win the grand prize. Now, there is something that I I want to note before I get into who this lens is for, that's if you have an RF 70 to 200 and you think you may want to get one of the converters, think again. It will not attach to your lens. So you cannot use the RF 70 to 200 2.8 with either the 1.4 or the 2X converter. It just won't attach. So who are these lenses for and which one should you get between a 600 and an 800? I mean, I think I would probably end up going with the 800 more often than not because I can get a 600 if I get a 150 to 600 Sigma, but then again, I would need an adapter to work on the any of the EOS R cameras. So I still think the 800 for me would give me more reach, but this is something for birders. If you're a birder and you're out there trying to find out what bird that is, or you just want to show your friends on Instagram the picture and you want a big lens that can do that, this is going to do it. The 800 and the 600 are going to do it. The autofocus was pretty fast. They have stepping motors in there. I, I should also tell you that when you do put it on the 2X converter and the 1.4, that the focus does take a little bit of a hit. It slows down. It's not as fast as if you used it natively connected to the body. What if you're a sports photographer? Well, if you shoot outdoor sports, I mean, if you're shooting rowing or crew, or if, which I think is rowing, I think crew and rowing are the same exact thing. I don't know, I've never actually done it, even though we've got the Daggale Regatta thing that used to happen or still happens down by the Schuylkill River. Uh, it is the Schuylkill, right? Yeah, yeah that is the Schuylkill. Um, it could be good for that. It could be good for surfing. It is a limiting lens. I don't think that you're going to use it for soccer or football because the subjects are going to be way too close. They're going to fill the frame way too much at 600 and at 800. And also at F11, how are you going to get enough shutter speed unless it's the brightest of brightest days in the world to, to, to freeze motion? Because if you're at 1 640th of a second at like 10,000 ISO all day, it's not going to look terribly too good. You may get the job done, but it may not be great. And before I forget, and before I wrap this up, I'm going to do a double sniffy sniff right now. Let's smell these lenses. Mmm. I don't know, man. That could be like strawberry lube. Who's been playing with these lenses, Steven? Was it you? My bad. Yeah, all right, strawberry, strawberry for Steven. I kind of like grape myself. Uh, wind tunnel test, all important. Here we go. <laughs> 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 
wind is not getting past these lenses. So what do you guys think? You're going to pick up a 600? You're going to pick an 800? You're not going to pick anything other than your nose because these lenses aren't for you. They're honestly not priced that bad for what they are. They can get the job done, but as I hammered home a million times in this video, you better know what you're doing with your exposure triangle in order to give you a fast enough shutter speed, but not be taking pictures that look like Swiss cheese. So thank you guys very much for watching. Jared Poland, Photo.com. See ya.